What's up, everybody? Michael Johnson here with the Business Choreography Podcast, and I'm excited you joined me today. We have a very important guest joining us on the show today. Today, we have Dan Steininger, and he is incredible. I can't wait for you to get in and hear what he has to share with you. Dan is an author and a columnist for Biz Times called Innovative Innovate or Die. He's a speaker both nationally and internationally and teaches innovation at Arizona State. Dan describes himself as a recovering lawyer and a recovering CEO. And we're going to find out more about that. And we're going to get so much great stuff today. So stay tuned. Let's play the intro and we'll get right to it. Listen, there's a lot to learn when growing and scaling your business. That's why we created the Business Choreography Podcast, where we talk about choreographing your marketing, operations, and sales into dynamic systems that increase your revenue and your impact. We'll explore solid business principles and discuss all things that make businesses dance to success with clarity. We'll help you figure out where the holes are in your business and what you can do to fix them. Think of us as your official business choreographers, aka your insider growth strategists. Remember, your choreography matters. Welcome to the Business Choreography Podcast. Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Michael. I, I did like that promo. It shows the heart of what you guys do, and it's good stuff. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, I'm excited to jump in, and I'm going to kind of let you take the reins and, and tell us what we're going to talk about today, because you have some incredible stuff that you're going to share. Thank you, Michael. I was going to, you know, usually you start off with the bio of the, the host, but we're not going to do that because I could talk about how I was born in a log cabin and went on to invent the internet. But I really want to share with the listeners today um, why you want to stay tuned. Um, just a short story. In my college years, I used to hop the, I lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'd hop the Great Northern, head out across uh, the Western Plains to the Glacier National Park where I worked every summer. And as you're coming across the plains of eastern Montana, suddenly you, you get you wake up. It's an overnight, and you wake up in the morning. You see the Rocky Mountains coming out of the plains. You're like, wow! And then, you know, you come into the station, and you're smelling that mountain air. And if you've heard of John Denver, you understand. Born again in the mountains, and it's a spectacular feeling. If you've never seen the Rocky Mountains, that is the crown jewel of the Rocky Mountains. But after I was there about two weeks, I was reading uh, Lewis and Clark's book, um, uh, how they were trying to get to the Pacific. Sure. And when they saw those same Rocky Mountains, like, oh, oh, boy, <laughs> these are barriers uh, to us getting to the Pacific. And at that point, they were stuck. They had a problem and a challenge. And what do you do now? They were smart enough to turn to a woman, Sacagawea, an Indian woman who knew and had been raised and knew how to find a pass through those mountains. But mountains are anything. Those challenges and problems that come to us personally and professionally. How do you get around them? How do you manage those problems? And it takes creativity, which they had. You might want to uh, avoid the mounds. You might want to use um, switchbacks to get over them or pass as they did. Or, But that's the point. Creativity and in innovation is what gets us through our problems in life. So if you have a pro personal problem or professional challenges in business, stay tuned because I'm going to give you a set of tools you can use immediately following this podcast. And therefore, it would be helpful to you. So there's the long and the short of it. That's my promise to you. You will leave here with a set of tools, the secret sauce of creativity you can use from the get-go. I love that. I appreciate that so much. And I know our listeners do. So let's dig into those tools and let's start going because I am so excited to hear about it. Sure. Um, so let's think about when we talk about creative people, what you think about artists, musicians, right? And or the geniuses or age, Elon Musk, um, Steve Jobs. But here's the here's the important thing for all the listeners to understand. All of you can be creative. Creative creativity is, is a skill. You can learn it like anything else. Um, and if you think about it, if for all of you who have kids, grandkids, whatever, just think about little children when they're first young. Uh, did you have to tell them to start playing with the toys you gave them? Uh, did you have to tell them they should crawl? Um, did you did you tell them they had to walk or they wouldn't get to eat dinner? <laughs> uh, and what's the most complex thing they've ever learned? And they learned it by five years of age. Speaking. They learned to speak and you never had to terrorize them or threaten them or bribe them. <laughs> and so the point is, is that creativity is inherent in all of us. So why aren't we naturally creative as we grow older? Well, <laughs> I have to tell you folks who are listening, it's talk about school. 
where you're, you're, you're rewarded to get the right answer, right? You don't right. tell a teacher, hey, I got a better way of solving that math problem. Or, and then you get to the world of work. And what do you do there? You, you don't tell your boss, uh, actually, I like your ideas, but no, I'm going to do it a different way. Good luck with that. <laughs> so basically, what, what creativity is all about is, is restoring in you the natural tendency. Now, let me tell you how important this is. And this is, I want everyone to see, take this very seriously. You all remember 9-11. When the plane, there was a woman, her name is Mary Pango, Maria Pangos, and she worked on the South Tower, the 98th floor. And they had a meeting set up for nine o'clock. When the plane hit the South Tower, no one could see it in the North Tower, but they felt this heat wave go through the whole floor. Second, she felt that she knew something had changed. She got up from her desk, didn't take any, went right to the elevators and started walking down. And as she's going there, people are saying, what are you doing? You know, we've, we've, got, we've got a meeting coming up and they're texting what's going on. A, jo a woman joined her as they're walking down. And the women said, oh, I forgot to take the pictures of my kids with me. So she went back. The reason I tell you this story is that Maria was the only person on that floor to survive to tell us what happened. Wow. So in other words, she acted in a moment, broke a habit, acted creatively, and it saved her life. Recently, and I'm in Arizona right now, um, I was out hiking. And I heard a rattle um, and bam, I got hit by a rattlesnake instantly. Oh. Now, rattlesnakes can be deadly. They can also cause you to use limbs. And like, okay, now what happens? So you had to get real creative fast. My wife called 911, but we agreed, let's tell them I have venom in me. I've been hit by a rattlesnake and bring the anti-venom. Okay, so we're waiting for the, for the, for the ambulance to come because we could see the parking lot. I've been a three mile hike. We were close enough to the parking lot. And I told her, look, I've been a Boy Scout. Um, I learned you've got to suck out the venom. And she gave me that look like, divorce first. <laughs> and, and I said, but, but I said, fine, but I'm going to write my funeral oration now. And, um, and then thinking, you can read it at my funeral. Well, she finally sucked it up and uh, put water on it. And True Grit style, John Wayne style, sucked out some of the venom. When I get to the helicopter, this is on a bizarre day, the captain comes out and goes, hi, I'm Captain Kirk. And I said, you're Captain Kirk? I must be the Easter Bunny, if that's true. <laughs> yeah. Fast forward, we get to the air room, and the, I got visited by top toxicologists in the state who said, I want to visit you because you had less venom in you than most rattlesnake victims. And I said, well, I told this story. I said, well, we don't, our science doesn't actually show that. I said, well, you can explain why I have less venom in me and why the cowboys and ranchers who settled this area never had anti-venom they survived. So, and then a few weeks later, I'm at the, in the airport going north and when I could walk again and people were coming up to me and saying, how'd your rattlesnake bite? And I said, well, how would you know? Oh, you were on the evening news. Um, <laughs> you're the only person who got anti-venom out in the field. So they've changed all the procedures. Anyhow, that's a story how creativity saved a lot of um, what could have been serious loss of limb, even life for myself. Sure. So what I'm going to share with you a little bit will help you navigate the tragedies of life as well as your professional life as a business person. So, so that's the long and the short of it. Um, so let's talk about creativity in general. What makes an Elon Musk? What makes a Steve Jobs? And why can you be known as a creative person? Every one of them always starts with one step one. Here's step one. It's a problem or challenge, what I call mountains. Every book I've written on this subject has involves mountains, conquering your mountains. <laughs> and recognizing um, that's a, to, and I call it embrace uncertainty. You don't know the answer. You're going to spend the time trying to understand how you got in this mess. And if you notice little kids, whenever they you're telling something or they have a question, they, um, they always talk, they're always saying, well, why? And you explain, well, why? And this goes on. Well, you use the five whys. Americans have a tendency to go, shoot, ready, aim. We always want to solve a problem instantly. Well, if you want to be creative, the first thing you have to do is spend time on that problem. Ask yourself five times why. If you're in a business meeting with your fellow professionals, five times you can do what we call a cause and effect diagram to outline all the causes. But spend the time to understand the problem and why that's important. Uh, it's because if you can't solve thinking, if you really don't know what the primary drivers of the of the of the problem is. So that's number one. Slow it down. Understand the problem. And I think sometimes just begin by saying, well, maybe it's my fault um, that I don't know. And, and uh, true story. 
I was a lawyer, as I told Michael, I, re- I always say I'm a recovering lawyer. Well, I then <laughs> one of my clients was a large financial institution. I was on their board, did a lot of their legal work, and they had some trouble. And when their CEO had 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 to step aside, they asked me to run it. And I said, well, no, I, I went to law school on the East Coast. I'm happy. I love friends at the Harvard Business School. I will never run a business. Well, they asked me to do it temporarily. And this went on for about a year to my my fellow partners in law firm said, buddy, you got to make a decision. We want the CEO of some company in our partnership. And I jumped ship and, and did it. So first meeting at this troubled financial institution, I got 11 vice presidents reporting me. And the first question I asked at our first meeting, what's our strategic plan? And I said, what's a strategic plan? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine what they thought? Oh, boy, we got we got a live one. But guess what happened? They began to realize I was serious. And I said, we're going to have one. You're going to have to come up with it. So if you want to be known as a creative leader, a creative individual, an innovative leader, begin by understanding, point to the people around you. I need your help. I don't know the answer. And this is counterintuitive, what we think about uh, leadership. Leaders are people who know all the answers. Uh, My bath of fire as an early on CEO was studying how it's being done. And I was frustrated by American management practices. Well, Nissan was building a new plant, first in America for Nissan, this goes back a ways, in Smyrna, Tennessee. And the Wall Street Journal reporter was interviewing the CEO, who is from Japan, he had a translator, and he wasn't getting his answers. And at some point, he got so frustrated, reporting, he just broke his pencil. And the president uh, the, the, asked him, what's the matter? He said, well, I'm trying to find out how you build your cars and you're not answering. And the president said, well, why are you asking me? I'm just the president. Why don't you go out there and ask the people who are building the cars? I wrote a piece in the University of Michigan's Business Review or HR Review about saying it's all over for the American auto industry. We cannot compete with people like this who value the employees. So so that's a, that's one of the important things about leadership. It's counterintuitive to the image of America that you have to have all the answers. But that's not the way. And what are our three best-selling cars? I take Toyota, Nissan, and Honda, right? It's still these many years later. So it's sad. So... Um, So number one, embrace uncertainty, take your time to understand the cause, and then reach out to teams sincerely that you're working with to have them help you come up with answers. And guess what? They're really going to think you're a brilliant leader, (laughs) truly. And and so number two is um, learning histories. Early on in my tenure, and this is really important, um, something happened that the company ends up in the media with a negative story. So I call a meeting and I say to everyone, okay, we need to get this solved because we're getting some bad press. How did this happen? And no one's answering. So I finally said, look, we're going to stay here all day till we find out. So someone finally raised their hand and said, uh, will we get into trouble if we tell you the truth? I said, no, we were here to find out the truth. Well, Dan, actually it was your idea. I said, my idea? Yeah. Remember I was walking down the hall about a week ago and I ran something by you. I said, oh yeah, that makes sense. Go try it. And there was this long pause and everyone was watching me. And I finally said, Well, that may be the dumbest thing I've ever come up with. (laughs) What do you think the management team thought? This guy's willing to admit mistakes. And if he's willing to admit mistakes, that means we can try things and take risks. When I was in the law school, I researched a case in the San Francisco federal court system. Japan Airlines flew into uh, San Francisco Harbor and um, and uh, the airport, which sits right on right on the harbor. And uh, it, the, the captain of the Japan Airlines was Captain Oso. And he took the plane in and he had this nice landing. There's one problem. He was short of the runway and the plane was actually softly landed in, in, the, in the harbor. And the passengers didn't know they weren't on the runway until they looked out the windows and saw sailboats. <laughs> so, uh, as always, a few weeks later, the, um, the, the federal agency investigating the FAA calls them in federal court. That's why I got to read the transcript. Captain Oso. Please raise your right hand. You promise you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth. Oh, yes, you go. So, Captain Oso, we're going to have a six-month investigation. At the end, we'll have findings of fact, conclusions of law, and then we'll issue a report. You understand? Yes. Now, begin with, on your judgment, why did this happen? And it was a long pause, and he goes, how you Americans say this? Captain Oso, screw up. <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes later, the hearing was over. <laughs> so, when problems occur and mistakes stop, the American tendency of pointing to people and you you screwed up, you made a mistake. No, these are learning opportunities. Do learning histories. You're not here. Everybody's going to make mistakes. It's a natural part of life. 
So learn from those things and how you can get better. So that's part of the analysis that you have to go through as a leader, not start to, the blame game. And then everyone plays, you know, CYA and you know what that like. You can waste all that time or you can get down to solving problems. So that's lesson number two. Um, step three, and this again applies in your personal life. Um, once you have identified the problem and, and put the causes in priority, now you need to begin the process of thinking through creative solutions. Now, there's a big mistake that Americans make, and we do this personally. Um, we want to jump to quick conclusions. We want to say, oh, I got the right idea. No, you don't want to do that. You want to suspend judgment as long as you can um, and put as many ideas in play. The other thing, if you're in a team meeting with other people, most of the time you will be when you're doing brainstorming or innovation, remember that 50% of the American public is um, are introverts. They don't want to speak up. So when you have a meeting like that, who do you think is going to dominate? True story, uh, Harvard Business School does a case study every year. You're on an airplane and it crashes in Greenland or some northern climate. And you've only got a couple hours to pick everything off that plane you need to survive. And they videotape this, much like Michael's doing this. All right. And they were playing it back in, at school. And they noticed one of the individuals who said nothing. And they finally turned to him and said, you haven't said a word. And he said, I know, I'm, I'm a little more shy. Well, what do you think of our solutions? He said, <laughs> You won't survive a day, much less to live to tell the story. Why? He said, well, I was raised in the back country. And here's what you really need to select if you were going to survive. What does that tell you? That, you know, the way we brainstorm now is terrible. People, extroverts tend to dominate and the wrong conclusions come. So one of the things you want to think about in profession when you're in business is tell, agree on the problem and then make everybody spend some time thinking creatively about solutions and then send their ideas to their team long before the meeting so that the introverts have a chance to be heard. And you can all then spend some time thinking about other pieces of solutions. So, so we do, most companies do it, um, brainstorming the wrong way. So this is giving you an idea of how to change how that's done. Another technique to use in brainstorming and as part of the creative process and that you should use in your personal life. In our brain, we have the right brain and the left brain. And all of you are tending to live, listen to me in your left brain. That's the analytical side, the language, mathematics. Right hemisphere is for the creative side. Now, why do I tell you this? If you went back thousands of years to when we were running around the plains of Africa and Europe and we were hunter-gatherers, if you saw an, as somebody coming in the distance, they had a spear or whatever, how did you know if they were friendly? How did you know if they were an enemy? How would you do that? You didn't have cell phones. You didn't have text. You couldn't call. didn't have email. So what human beings did is developed a system of signaling. And what they would usually do is use humor to show I'm a friendly guy. They may have done some silly dance. Who knows what they all did? What that does is it relaxes people and it moves you into your right side hemisphere. So as you do brainstorming, build into your meetings. You can find plenty of humor up, YouTube clips, who knows what. You play things that get people laughing. It reduces the politics. It reduces the tendency to people not to suggest pretty way out ideas. So not only that, but build it into your personal life, too. So that's going to give you a chance to enjoy yourself at the same time looking for creative solutions. Um, give you an example. Um, so you have, I'm sure many of you have heard of the blue ocean, red ocean. Of course. Yeah. OK, so in your thinking of solutions, try to do homework to understand the crowd you're trying to appeal to. Um, so there's this little wine company in Australia who wanted to introduce a new wine. And they looked at the wine market. It was competitive. It was pricey. It was very sophisticated. And they well, how are we going to do that? So they went to the people who are beer drinkers and hard drinkers, mixed drinkers, and said, why don't you drink wine? Well, what they found out is people were intimidated by all of this brand and all these fancy names and price points and, and even thought the taste was a little strange sometimes. So they decided to come up with a wine that was priced less, uh, was simpler, you know, and, and tasted a little more palatable. And they launched it. That mm -hmm. wine became the fastest growing wine brand in the history of the world. And it's called wow. Yellowtail. And you can get Yellowtail. And they found the blue ocean where right. you didn't have competition rather than compete in the red ocean where the wine 
So those are the things that you can start to think about when you're, what are those blue oceans that we're, the sandbox we're not playing in when we do that? So that's, um, that's an important trick to remember as you're doing this. Look, um, and it's called ethnographic research. Look, let me give you another example about as you're doing your research to understand creative ideas. If you live in a home or, and, and have a yard, most people have to cut the grass, right? Now, in any given block, if you go down that block, you'll see some people do amazing jobs. Other people are less careless, whatever. The point I'm making is that even a simple thing as cutting your grass is driven by values. Try to under, underscore the values of the people that you're appealing to. I know Michael and his partner do that or they wouldn't have succeeded. They understand their audience. So those, but every decision people make are driven by values. So try to uncover those values. Um, a while back, I had um, I was lucky in early March of 2020 to get COVID, and um, and of course you had another doctor every day, you had another nurse five times a day. What I kept thinking about the process is how poorly doctors understood the patient experience. You know, I think I'd recommend patients, if you your doctors, if you're going to improve the hospital experience, try being a patient in your own hospital. I mean, walk in their shoes. So as you're brainstorming, think about things you can do to better understand your customer base. So that would enhance your, your ability to be cr creative in coming up with creative and innovative solutions. And that's the column I write is, as Michael said, it's called innovate or die. And you know, through the pandemic, how many businesses bit the dust because they couldn't innovate in a very traumatic time. So anyhow, so that's step three, how to do more, um, more sensible ways of, of coming up with solutions. Um, Michael, you can stop me if I get too wound up. <laughs> no, we're doing great. We're, we're moving right into number four. Okay. Number four. Okay. Now you've got a list of ideas. First of all, create a, 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 a way which you judge them. Let's say you're trying to buy a car, you know, car A, car B, car C. Create a simple matrix of what is it that you think is ideal. So if you're going to buy a car, oh, I want just fuel efficiency or I want safety or I want status, or I want low cost, put those criteria by which you're going to judge the car you're going to buy on a little matrix, and then put the names of the cars up top up, and then rate each one. Each one's weighted. So if you want safety as number one, it gets five on a five point scale. And each car gets a numerical value. It's not scientific. But then when you add up the columns at the bottom, it's going to point to the car you should be seriously considering. So right. You can apply this, obviously, you're doing a sophisticated product rate, rate um, rollout, it's going to be far more complex. But that's where Americans so often get stuck in leadership. They don't spend the time looking at the criteria by which we should select the best of the ideas we've come up with. So there's another thing, another little trick that what I call the secret sauce of innovation and creativity. Come up with a scorecard that evaluates the ideas you're looking at. And, 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 and so that'll help you get over that barrier. Um, now you've got ideas, you thought these things got legs, you don't know here. And I started an organization called BizStarts that helps entrepreneurs, uh, start organizations. Michael would have been a client of ours back then. He's an entrepreneur. He started a business. He's, uh, he's what makes America great. And Lexi too. I mean, they are created a, a wonderful dynamic for business leaders to learn to get better while they're listening in their cars. How are you going to beat that? Um, but my organization helps mentor people who are starting companies. Now, what the hallmark of every entrepreneur who's ever succeeded, whether it's Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, or all the great ones going all the way back to Coco Chanel, um, what do they do different? And one of the things they do is they test and pivot, test and pivot. Elon Musk realized that the Russians were launching most space satellites and they own the market. Well, he saw an opportunity. There's a problem. He saw an opportunity. And so he created SpaceX. Now, he had he did three launches, each one to test this new vehicle, spacecraft they come up with, this new rocket. It's supposed to go up and land back on Earth and, and be safe. Everyone blew up. Three of them <laughs> blew up. He was testing and wasn't working. He could go one more and he was bankrupt. Here's the risk. But he believed in his team. He thinks they finally did it. They learned from their mistakes. So they launched number four. Now, if launch four made it, the world changed because um, NASA said, we'll only look at you if you have a successful launch. 
It had that crashed, we wouldn't know who Elon Musk was. He launched it, and guess what? That particular rocket made it. And after that, he now is responsible for 85 to 90 percent of the rocket launches from NASA. He's the dominant figure in launches throughout the world. Companies from all the world, countries from all the world come to Elon Musk to launch their satellites. So that talked about a guy willing to experiment. Same with Steve Jobs. They were willing to always experiment and learn. So those Thomas Edison once asked, and you may have heard this, uh, how did he handle 1,000 failures when he tested filaments for his electric light bulb? He said, I never had a failure. What do you mean you didn't have a failure? You went through 1,000. No, 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 no. Those were all experiments. Every business, every entrepreneur I've ever worked with, and I've run an angel network, which capitalized early stage people like Michael, um, all believe we're our own, <laughs> we all drink our own uh, cooking, right? It's, we drink the Kool-Aid. Our friends say they love what we're doing. Our friends, you know, are meterella. Oh, yeah, that's great. But we haven't proven if it works in the marketplace. And I'll, Michael, I'm sure you can tell us stories about how you pivoted from your early offerings to where you are today, the changes you must have made along the way. So the reason you test and you look at that test, even if it fails, bam, you pivot and keep tweaking and keep tweaking till it works. And if you don't find the solution, that's okay. We're gonna, not everything in the world is going to work, but you have to be willing to test those things and see if they work. I can give you a real life example in one of my many, uh, I think I'm unemployable. I've had so many careers, but <laughs> I served as chairman of the uh, board that oversees the Port of Milwaukee. Now you'd wonder, Port of Milwaukee, isn't that an inland city? Yes, we're on the Great Lakes, but most people on the coast don't realize is that it's an international port that ships out through the Lake St. Lawrence Seaway every year to the international markets. The port was sinking when the mayor called and asked me to head it up and get it turned around. And I told the mayor, look, mayor, I don't know which end of a ship ship is up. I said, yeah, yeah but you, you're credible in business. You'll figure it out. Right. Anyhow, I had the part company with the then port director, hired a guy out of Houston who was running his own company. It was very innovative. And a couple of things he said, well, why are you closed four months of the year? And I said, you're in Houston. It's called ICE. <laughs> ICE, <laughs> ICE, the St. Lawrence Seaway. Well, we got to do something about that. I said, well, good luck with that. Um, but anyhow, what happened is eventually he convinced the Maritime Administration in, in Washington to allow barging from Milwaukee down to Chicago, through the Chicago River, down the Mississippi to New Orleans and International Port. So we could have year round shipping. Wow. Uh, and talk about, and, and another thing was, he pointed out, I'm in Milwaukee, and we had a lot of business people going over to Michigan, because it's a great state, it's got a lot of great businesses. Well, the drive there, which most businessmen wanted to do, you had to go through Chicago's traffic, and then Gary, Indiana, it's a brutal, brutal drive. Well, he came up with the idea of a high-speed ferry to, um, to Michigan, where you could drive on and go right from Milwaukee across the Muskegon, right across the lake. And by the way, for you coast folks, uh, Lake Michigan's a hundred miles. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a large body of water. Right. And, um, and he came to me to get the venture capital, which I do to some friends. I remember calling one of my VC friends saying, I need some capital. How much Danny? And I said, well, it's around 20 million. Whoa, that's a lot. What's it for? I said, for a boat. He said, is there something wrong with my phone? Did you say 20 million for a boat? I said, don't hang up. Uh, let us at least talk to you. Well, they eventually capitalized it. We had to build a ship because of the Jones Act in the United States. We had to find a port. Uh, shipbuilding outfit down in uh, Alabama and created this high, the first high speed ferry service in the United States. To this day, it now launches from Milwaukee, to Michigan through most of the year and it's become a major success and made money for the investors as well. Right. So we saw a problem by innovative thinking, even in government. And what's amazing right. about the Port of Milwaukee, it contributes to the tax base of the silly city. One other thing along that lines to the port, the Port of Milwaukee is spanned by a high rise bridge. It's interesting enough named after my grandfather, Daniel Hone, who was the mayor of Milwaukee in the last century, ranked as on cover of Time magazine and in, in, in the last century as one of the mayor of the best run city in America. So, but nobody knew who he was, even in Milwaukee. So I figured, okay, maybe we should light this bridge. And I reached out to some young millennials and I said, you're probably living with your parents' basement. Why don't we do something exciting? Light what? Light the city's Milwaukee skylight. Well, $4 million capital campaign, got it done. That bridge lights up, LED lights, it can sync to music. It is exciting. And the committee for the RNC, Revoke and Creek, came to Milwaukee. That was one of the factors they chose Milwaukee for the RNC convention next year. Think about wow. that. 
So again, use of a problem, an opportunity, and using creative skills. So those are some real life examples. Of, I actually put this stuff down. Now, you all business in, in you as professionals want to be known as creative leaders, creative and or innovative leaders. But one thing I want to share with you, and this is important. You cannot ask people working for you or with you to be creative unless you practice it in your own life. So here's a couple of tips that you can start when this podcast is, is over. First of all, you're listening to the podcast. So you have solved problem number one. Creative people are curious. The fact that you went to this podcast and are actually listening, you've already gone, to, you already passed go. Okay. But everything you do, you know, if you take a way, to, one way to work, try a different way. Uh, if you're planning a vacation, you know, study, find out what's going on. Creative people are constantly looking for different ways to do things. Elon Musk, he wanted to do electric car company, but the batteries of the day weren't doing it. And he heard some young engineer who had figured out you could tether lithium batteries together and make a car work. He reaches out to this young guy who'd never been in a car company before, had come up with this idea, and ended up hiring him. That led to Tesla. Think about that. Talk to a young engineer, no track record in the car industry, and he gets hired to be the engineer to mastermind lithium batteries for Tesla. And, and now Tesla has a market cap bigger than the big three auto companies in the United States. So, um, so start, you know, live a creative life. Think of things that you can do with Google or different podcasts, starting with Michael and Lexi's because this is because that shows you you care, you want, you're curious about life. Another thing, and we've talked a little bit about it, build humor into your life daily because humor moves you from that analytical left brain to your right brain. And that allows you to think creatively. Um, and, and another thing, and, and how, there's another way, think of techniques of you can do um, to get yourself to be creative. Steve Jobs was, was well known for his walks. He would go for these long walks and come up with ideas. Um, people told me they come up with great ideas in their shower or when they're driving to work. Um, I'm a swimmer and I come up with great ideas. The problem is early on in my CEO days, I would uh, I would write my ideas at the end of my swim lane. And the problem is the ink would blur. So I would go back to the office and show it to my assistant and say, these are great ideas. What have I written? And they, we can't read it. <laughs> so I got a, a pencil that works on wet, with a pad that is okay with water. So whatever it is, um, you know, people, when you sleep, don't you? You wake up in the morning, you come up with some ideas you hadn't thought about. Now, why does that happen? And this is what I want everyone really to take home with you. Um, in our brains, we got constant flood of information coming at us all day long. I mean, if you're out driving, you're seeing advertisement, other cars. Are, it's our executive brain is processing three to 4,000 things a day. It's exhausting. What happens when you sleep at night, the executive brain turns off. That's why you get all these weird dreams. Literally, because you no longer have a, a, a filter on what you're, you're thinking about at night. So that's why your creative brain hops. But you can actually do that during the day. And here's what I recommend to everybody. Build into every day of your life solitude, where you turn off your laptop, you turn off your cell phone, and you're just quiet. Maybe you're just going for a walk. Whatever. Build some solitude into your day because that turns off your executive brain. And that allows your creative side to start coming up with solutions. So there's another little tip you can start using as of today. Another thing is one of the things that, and, and you should be writing these things down if you're not driving. If you're driving, don't write them down. <laughs> um, our emotions play a huge part in our life, okay? Um, whether it's emotions of joy or anger. How many times have you read about drive-by shootings? Or they say that most, particularly young people, when they've shot somebody in a fight and they're apprehended, they break down crying because they had no idea the power of that gun and they were going to kill somebody. And they're just a wreck. Um, anger can really interfere with our ability to have sensible responses. So when something's horrible's happened, whatever that tragedy is, take a deep breath. Begin by asking yourself, could I have contributed to this? And, and, and even if it didn't, Take your time to think of a measured response, because if you let anger dominate your response, you're not going to come up with a sensible response, even though you'd like to, um, because people get shot on freeways when they have anger management problems. So your emotions are a big block to being creative. 
So remember, you have the ability with your brain to control your emotions. That's why they call it emotional intelligence, that your intelligence can actually control your emotions. And so when you when these tragedies come along and, and only, you know, you maybe be lucky, but we're all going to get them in our lives. Um, take a deep breath and recognize you have a brain to think through some interesting creative solutions to what's happening to you. So keep that in mind, those brilliant tips, if I don't say so. Now, a <laughs> couple as we wind down, I don't know where I'm on time-wise, Michael, but um, look, we're human beings. We go through life. We're not going to live forever, right? I wish I could, but we just lost Char uh, Charlie Munger at 99 and, and Henry Kissinger at 100, but this is not going to have a good end, let's face it. But between now and then, um, we're all going to get some tragedy in our life. Friends die, people backstab us, you get an injury. I got malaria in Africa, and then I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Kenya, East Africa as a teacher up country Africa, and I got malaria. The idea, well, well, I can sit and complain about it all day or try to find a creative solution. These tragedies are inevitable. Some are just horrible. Lo loss of a loved one. And we've all heard of post-traumatic stress syndrome, okay? I mean, it's inevitable. It happens. You go into shock. These horrible things happen. What life is, teaches us, and, and I can give hundreds of examples, I call it post-traumatic growth. You've lost a job. You've lost a loved one. You go through the grieving process. But you go on to growth as a human being. You use those tragedies. One woman, I remember how uh, she lost her husband very young and, uh, and a terrible thing with three kids. And um, it just you know, shattered her life. But she eventually picked up the things and then became for 30 years one of the best speakers in the National Speakers Association and, and has an amazing life. That tragedy propelled her to do something she never would have done. So when those things come along in your life, Take a pause. You're going to go through living, as Winston Churchill said, when you go through hell, just keep going. But eventually understand there's an opportunity there, as hard as it may be, to recover. So um, with that said, um, I can share with them, Michael, if you want, how they can get in touch with me. One way or the other, it's up to you. Absolutely. We'd love to hear. How can people that have been listening to, to all of this today be able to find you and, and follow you and keep in touch? Okay, I'll make it real simple. Uh, best is to go to LinkedIn, and my name is Dan Steininger. And I told Michael, just think of a beer stein. So Dan, <laughs> S-T-E-I-N-I-N-G-E-R Steininger, just kicked on my LinkedIn profile, and you'll see my, um, my newsletters there. Click on one of those newsletters and hit subscribe, so you'll start getting it. And, I'm, you know, a couple times a month, I share some tips uh, to think about. I mean, the one I wrote that just was published yesterday was, are creative people lucky? And most creative people will say, yes, we're lucky. And I said, I disagree. I quoted Ben Hogan, who was the, one of the, the greatest golfer we've known of all time, said, golf is a game of luck. The more I practice, the luckier I get. So I <laughs> tell people how creative people tend to make their luck. And right. it's a little knows how you go about doing that. So you can do that. So you sign up to my newsletter. Um, you can then, and, and you can uh, send me, um, on, you know, you can communicate with me through LinkedIn and then I'll give you my email address. I don't want to drive you nuts. But if you got a problem or a challenge that's driving you nuts, either personally or professionally, I'm at a point in my life I can share some advice worth thinking about. It's nice to have someone that reflect, not give you the answers, but say, OK, try these things and trying to come up with a solution. I'm happy to share that with you because I can take, it's just like why I do. I teach at this point in my life. It's fun to, to tell people navigate life and it's all of its challenges. Um, and so I'm glad to share some thoughts with you if you want to reach out to me through LinkedIn. And at that point, I'll give you my email and we can, we can then communicate. So that'll make it simple. And in the meantime, you can get that newsletter and twice a month, tweak yourself as to why am I not trying that? Why am I trying that? So there, I've worn myself out, Michael. I need a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I appreciate all of the wisdom and, and knowledge from your journey and the absolute gold that you shared with us today. It has been an absolute pleasure. And so guys, go check out uh, Dan on his LinkedIn and we'll have those in the notes for you to, to take a look at and make sure you go check it out and follow him and get into the newsletter so that you can get these tips on a regular basis. Guys, I appreciate you all being here today and listening and make sure you go back, pause it, rewind, listen again. There's so many good things like 
Dan told you to do. Take some notes. For goodness sakes, take some notes because you don't learn it all at once. And yeah. hearing again is going to help it actually stick in your mind. So please go back, listen again, and let Dan know how much you appreciate him today on the show. As usual, I want you guys to keep choreographing your business, all parts of your business, including what's going on between those ears, because sometimes that's the hardest part. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode. Thank you so much for being here, Dan. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated. Thanks for joining us today. Want more business choreography? Check out our website at bizchoreo.com to find out more. And find out how the choreography for your marketing operations and sales can raise your revenue and create more impact. Remember, every business needs choreography.